Hey everybody, Bob WP here, and welcome to Do the Woo, the Woo Commerce Builder Podcast. This show is brought to you by OSTraining.com, keeping your clients and yourself up to date with learning WordPress and WooCommerce. And Nexus, manage hosting plans that keep Woo shops powerful, profitable, and error-free. I'll share more about our pod friends later in the show, but let's jump into another dev chat with Carl and Zach. This time they bring in Vainon from WPCS to talk about multi-tenant sites. Now, I wish I could say that firmly, but of course, performance rears its head as well, plus the usual dev diversions that come expectedly with these dev chats. But rest assured, you'll learn a lot about multi-tenant sites. So grab your favorite beverage and dive into some serious dev chat. Well, welcome to another episode of uh, the Do The Woo Dev Chats. I'm Zach Stepik. I'm here with Carl, Carl Alexander. How are you doing today, Carl? I'm doing good. How about you? We got a lot of snow here. Yeah, we've got a little here. We got uh, snowed on pretty hard yesterday, but uh, um, today we're going to be talking a bit about uh, multi-tenant WordPress and how that applies to WooCommerce stores. So uh, we brought in uh, an expert. Uh, Well, yeah, an expert on multi-tenant WordPress, somebody who's built a business around it. So, Vainand, we, we uh, would like to introduce you to the Do The Woo community. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Vainand van Leeuwen. Um, I'm CEO um, and co-founder of WPCS.io. Um, and we have a multi-tenant WordPress platform um, that we have had for, um, I think it's about two years now. Um, and that we just keep on expanding to keep on growing and we try to keep uh, we try to sort of get the word out of the bliss that is multi-tenant purpose <laughs> you know we can definitely start out just by talking about some of the perils of using multi-site in an environment where you have multiple woocommerce stores um, we know woocommerce is very data heavy to begin with so adding that layer of you know multi-site on top of it and having all of these various stores worth of data living in a single database is kind of my nightmare scenario yeah yeah and and i think rightfully so and i I mean in 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 that sense it sort of depends on how deep you want to go into the whole infrastructural layer of it all i think that's that's the that's the biggest point with with this whole multi-tent or at least with the whole uh, multi-site and why multi-tenancy could actually be a nice thing if you don't actually want to learn a lot about what makes a server go quick, then multi-site might might really not be for you, especially with a data heavy application as um, uh, as WooCommerce, because before you know it, you're gonna have to do something with the database that might be called sharding, or it might be something else. And now instead of working with orders and working with post meta and working with uh, PHP, you're actually doing Linux administration. Y- you gotta want that. You really gotta want that. Yeah, you do. You really do. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we have everybody on the call here, I think, is very familiar with uh, sitting in a terminal and (laughs) dealing with command line. Yeah, I mean, I have like a customer that's like multi-site WooCommerce. And yeah, the database side is is fun. You know, the export has like a thousand tables, you know, like, (laughs) yeah, a little bit. It's a little bit. It's 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 fun. It's fun. You, I learned a lot. Actually, actually, I had to learn a lot of like really quickly some a lot of DBA things for like just like doing better like backups, like just doing a MySQL dump of that and then re-exporting, re-importing it um, in the cloud just kind of blew up the database server in the cloud. <laughs> like it was just like. I can imagine. Yeah. So there's a lot to learn about that. This, the database side is definitely not. On the fun side, of things. <laughs> I mean, I would I would even say it's on the on the on the expert side of things. Oh yeah, for sure. If you if you really want to do a thousand table, and these are not small tables, probably for your client. Um, if you if you actually want to do an export and an import for that in production, 
I can imagine that it would be really helpful to be a DBA with years of experience. Yeah, that's why I said I had to do a crash course kind of for the yeah. on the backup side just to basically do like MySQL backup just like the defaults just didn't didn't apply to to that kind of thing and I'm just like I would never call myself a DBA because I know I know better. Yeah. I'm like at the stage of like the Dunning Kroger effect where like I wouldn't call myself a security expert because I know like enough about security to not call myself a security expert. And then the same thing I feel about like DBA is like I know enough about database administration to not call myself one. <laughs> I feel I feel the same way about myself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I know you enough know, once... to sort of avoid these certain things if I don't want to run into any problems there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true. And yeah, there there is this level you reach. Yeah, or you're aware of the depth. Like exactly, I like like DBAs to me are like real magicians. You know, like <laughs> like how they know like the internal guts of. I've been saying this. I mean, that's probably a good tangent to go into. But like, I've been. I think we talked about this, Zach, too. But it was like, I really feel WordPress. And WooCommerce, even separately, should both have like a DBA on staff, like just so that they can like run code things through them and be like, does this make sense? And they're like, no, you're crazy. Like, please don't do that. Like, this is misery. The problem with that is that the DBA would say that the WordPress way is wrong from day one, just because the the structure is so against everything they're taught, right? And it works for us. It works incredibly well in most cases. The, you know, the whole uh, entity value relationship and the the one to one mapping of everything. Um, but you know, the way that we store post meta is a DBA's nightmare, uh, especially in a WooCommerce site where there's so much of it. Um, so, you know, most DBAs that I've worked with like having well-structured tables that relate to entities and not just to everything. How, how odd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> Why would they do that? Yeah. 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 It, does, it doesn't make any sense. Well, we, we do it the right way. I mean, it's a tricky one. I think we talked a bit about it. Like entity attribute value is a very valid um, data structure to use. That's what Magento uses as well for, like internally it is just as you said it's kind of a dba's like worst nightmare because you basically let them do whatever they want with the database and they store anything and there's just no structure to the data that's easily figure about that you can easily figure out and query on well and that's really the biggest problem is you know now we have plugin authors who have built anything you can think of on top of this entity attribute value structure. Um, and you know, one of those things was an entire e-commerce platform and, uh, nobody a popular one nowadays. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's incredibly popular. And, you know, I don't think at the beginning, uh, way back in the days of Jigo shop that anybody working on that team thought, Oh, this is going to power, you know, hundred million dollar websites in the future. I think it just was, this is a cool way to do e-commerce on WordPress. Let's build it. And now we're, we're at the point where there are these, you know, eight, nine figure stores sitting on WooCommerce. And now the database structure doesn't look as good as it once did, especially for orders. And so, uh, the one thing that did happen while we were on break here is high performance order storage came out. Um, so we have the the flag now, the feature flag for being able to enable high performance order storage. But the default still stores everything into post meta too, which means it's actually increasing the load on the database to maintain a backward compatibility layer until we can turn that backward compatibility off. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah and and I, one of the big effects that has had is that a lot of that strain uh, comes down to the infrastructure that you're actually hosting this stuff on so if you if you want to actually run let alone a multi-site if you if you want to run this 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 million dollar store then you're just gonna have to have big hardware simple as that 
and then with performance gains like 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 what came out that that will definitely help and that that will also maybe make it possible to actually lower your your infrastructure maybe a bit maybe make it a bit cheaper but all in all i think that's really what's 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 happening there uh, in terms of this can like the top layer um of WordPress, for example, can remain a bit more simplistic, a bit easier to grasp, and a bit easier, a bit more flexible also. Um, but then something else has to carry that complexity. And in I think most cases that's just that just comes down to having um a wicked CPU and a bunch of RAM. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. And you know, I've run some really large WooCommerce sites, and those sites they required a very scalable infrastructure with uh, the ability to, you know, scale with demand and nearly instantaneously. And they required things like Elastic Beanstalk and just the ability to, you know, if they were going to have a marketing event to pre-scale before the marketing event, right? So that because even Elastic Beanstalk couldn't spin up servers fast enough to meet demand sometimes, which is what happens when you have 2 million people on an email marketing list. You know, these types of things, these types of of scenarios aren't the norm for WooCommerce, but at the top end of the market where people are doing this, these things become very important. And I remember, you know, years ago having conversations with the WooCommerce team about this when when they first released um, the data object classes, the uh, CRUD classes for all of the object types in WooCommerce in 2017. Uh, you know, and that was WooCommerce 2.7 that all of this started in. Um, and it's been six years. And now, just now, the WooCommerce team has released something that uses that to move data out of the posts and post meta tables. And of course it was orders because orders have been a bottleneck. We've talked about that on this show before, um, how creating 50 pieces of post meta per order is a gigantic bottleneck when WordPress only allows you to add one post meta record per call. So, you know, that's 50 separate database calls with every order. So, of course, they tackled high-performance order storage first because that bottleneck stops you from making money. Simple as that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. It, yeah, it really is the, it, it's the one that made the most sense to, to take care of first. So I don't want to you know, stay on high-performance order storage the whole time. I mean, I feel like that's, that's a recurring topic whenever I speak to anyone that does any sort of like serious WooCommerce hosting. No, it definitely is. And I think, and I think in that sense, um, even if you're not running million-dollar sites, um, if you're running 50 relatively popular sites, you run into exactly the same thing. And when we're talking about million dollar sites, that's 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 probably that's a big exception, right? That's 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 pretty um, uh, that's an outlier in that sense. But having fifty ish performing sites, that's pretty easy to come by. Uh, it, it it seems having like these these sites that actually um, uh, will also ruin your database on a day to day basis simply by having a couple of hundred customers come in. And doing fifty uh, requests to the database uh, because somebody, like everybody, actually orders something because three or four of those stores have a marketing thing going on. So I think, in that sense, making that outlier of a million dollar uh, store um, more sensible for for mo- most, if if more, if not most people, um, just try to handle it with fifty sites in a multi site, for example, especially in a multi site. <laughs> um, and I think that's that's also where, um, and I think that that's that's probably one of the one of the first points where multi tenancy comes in, uh, because having the ability to not use the same database for each and every one of your sites, and actually having those sites be um, be it logically isolated, but maybe even having them on completely different servers, um, that is already a major win where 
more success because you're really good at the WordPress thing that you're doing, because you're really good at e-commerce, does not necessarily equate requiring to become good with um, Linux or even becoming a bit of a DBA. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that um, a big thing there is, you know, talking about the differentiation between what multi-site is and what multi-tenancy is. And and we'll get to that in just a moment. But before we leave the HPOS topic completely. Yeah, so I was like looking. So I, it's kind of funny that we're talking about this because I was doing load tests yesterday with someone. And just to give an idea for people, like, so we were doing a pretty extreme load test. We were trying to basically hammer 1,500 use, people checking out. But on RDS, I like for 15 minutes, basically, like hammering it for 15 minutes. So on RDS, the number of inserts per second was 1,500. Yep. I, I think I read something oh, somewhere geez. about this. So, <laughs> so like, so just to give you an idea of like how many <laughs> inserts happening on the database when you have like this kind of like uh, Zach's talking about it and what the Vailan, Vainan, Vainan. Yeah, I was. I need to practice like <laughs> yeah. saying it. I didn't say it yet, so that's why I'm like messing it up. But um, but what he was talking about is that because when you shard. Like, let's say like that that amount of, of orders is coming through different stores, then you can distribute that o- across databases. Here we were testing one store, but it's just to give people a bit of an idea of of like what we're talking about when we're saying like uh, the way that the the why they need to change that is because when you're doing a lot of post metas like that, it creates a lot of inserts. Like instead of inserting one row. Like the high order table, you would insert data in one row. And before you would need maybe like 20 inserts to do that. So like you're, I'm just throwing numbers out, but like basically you're dropping it by a factor. of Yeah, it's, it's actually 50 per order. So yeah, so exactly. So it's an insane amount. So like just here where I'm talking, like I'm doing 1500 a second for that because that wasn't using high order tables. So uh, like I was just trying to brute force um, like an installation, but if we use that, like if we use a 50, so you would be dividing that by 50. So it's, it's, it's a huge, huge, huge difference uh, in terms of how much strain your database server can handle. That's why it's, it comes up all the time because for a lot of people, they don't really you know, for, for most of us, for most people, like you're running a store and it's a small store, right? It's not getting necessarily a ton of orders all the time. So you're not really, it doesn't really, okay, I'm doing 50 inserts. Yeah, that's not a big deal. I'm getting like three, four orders. But like for those like larger stores, you're you're going to a realm where you like, that's why the DBA is basically crying in a corner in a fetal position because he he's like why why are you doing this to me what did i do to you uh to deserve this from you and that's why there's so much pressure on this change because this change drops it by a factor of 50 and yeah. that's massive well, close to yes yeah i'm just uh, we're just showing numbers but it's still it's a big number right it's a it's a non trivial even if it was 20 like i said initially like dropping something by a factor of 20 is a 95% reduction you know, it's it's so it's like it's still it's still insane, right? So, by fifty, it's like ninety eight percent reduction. It's like it's a mind boggling amount of performance change at the database level. But the key is if you want to take advantage of that, if you turn on high performance order storage now, it defaults to having another feature enabled, and that's the backward compatibility feature, where it's still saving everything. To post meta so that's actually going to hurt performance for a little while yeah can you disable that i don't know anything i don't know enough about the guts can you disable like you can turn the compatibility off the caveat is if you turn the compatibility layer off there's no way to go back ever so know that you're making this this change that is a line in the sand and you can't go back afterwards. So back up your site, make sure, you know, all your data is uh, in an offline location that you control, you know, uh, so that you have the before 
just in case you ever need to go and look at it and come back. Um, I don't see that being a problem. They've done some great work on making sure this works. There will be migrations moving forward if they have to change data structure at any point. Just to be safe, make sure you have a good copy of all of your data before you make that change, because this is an irreversible change without the backward compatibility enabled. So, yeah, just a caveat. Keep that in mind. Just, it, just it's, small it's a little tiny little there. thing. Now, <laughs> the if you're tiniest, starting, the tiniest of details. If you're starting a new <laughs> store, though, there is absolutely no reason not to start from day one with high performance order storage enabled. Just absolutely no reason. Yeah, you're you're saving yourself and your host a lot of trouble, basically. If yeah, grief. Yeah, if we want to be more explicit about it. So yeah, uh, that that's all I really have to say about high performance order storage right now. Um, <laughs> now we've, uh, I think we've beaten this to death on this podcast over the time that it was in development, and it's just nice to see it here. But I did mention that we were going to talk about the differences between uh, multi-site and multi-tenancy. Uh, what's the difference with multi-tenancy? What's the differentiator there? So I would say the biggest differentiator is the fact that with a multi-site, uh, you, you you make one multi-site out of one installation. Exactly what you said. You know, so if you have your one server, you have your one database, and you can do with that what you can also do with a normal WordPress installation. Um, multi-tenancy would be the, um, at least how we also envision it, um, would be the idea of having a lot of single sites that share their functionality but have different databases in the sense of having different tenants. That idea allows you to, for example, put different uh, different infrastructure under different databases, under different um, uh, uh, servers running PHP, basically having the idea of multi-site that you install a plugin and it's available and maybe even activated everywhere, but having that within a single site context, because I think that's also sort of where that came from for, for us. We, we had an agency before this and we build like uh, WordPress websites. Side note. So, sorry. I, I have to say like, there's so many hosting companies that started off as agents. We, we all become very salty. <laughs> yeah. No, it's kind of, no, it's not. It's, it's just something I, I like to like point, point out to people. Um, oftentimes they, they're like, Oh, like so hard to like, how did you start a hosting company? I'm like, well, half the time there are agencies before. Um, I think that's the perfect place to start to see like, no, but this can be done differently and better. And I want to make sure that that actually happens. Right. That's, that's also why I wouldn't necessarily call us a hosting company, but more like a cloud platform because the hosting is definitely there, but it's like a part of it. Right. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Sorry, I don't mean like, ho- but you know what I mean, like just hosting websites, like, totally, like, yeah. but it's, yeah, I mean, like you said, because also you, you kind of get your, you get kind of an idea of the pain from just doing it for your clients as well. Um, so like that makes a, that makes like an easy transition as well. So, you know, you probably started working on this kind of multi-tenant setup through the agency, right? I mean, basically, yeah, yeah, basically, because like the, the 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 big annoyance for me was was sort of twofold. It was on the one hand, at some point you have a bit of a preferential stack, right? Uh, somebody asks for a new site, and you just know exactly what you're going to use because you're like, I know these tools, I know these plugins, and that's just what's going to happen. I'll make sure it's configured properly for you, right? I was kind of getting sick of having to set that up all the time. And obviously there's a bunch of templating uh, things out there. Um, But the other thing that I was getting a bit sick of was the idea that after like four or five clients, I would definitely make a change in my stack. I would definitely make sure that um, this plugin maybe is is, uh, 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 replaced by a better plugin, by a newer plugin. Obviously a bunch of updates happen. And that would always be in the last site I built. And that would never actually go back to one of the first sites I built. Because 
I can do that, but that's like free work, and that's really not how an agency works. <laughs> but also, like your your clients, I I mean, from my days in agency, like the clients didn't want to pay for that either, right? Like they didn't want to pay for updates. They didn't want to pay to like make sure the site worked or the plugin up till they got hacked or something. Then you'd scare them about getting hacked. <laughs> then then you yeah. scare them about getting hacked, and they'd be like, "Oh no!" Like okay, like please, uh, they, like. That's the type of client that wouldn't buy a lock for their door if they didn't know why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I completely relate to that, like uh, like that st- that agency story. Because, yeah, the newer project have the newer stuff, and then everything else slowly falls behind because you never, like, update. No, exactly. And, and then, all, uh, and then I mean, also, you'll, you'll always get, after you've, you've sort of revamped your whole stack and you're really happy with it and you're re- really happy to work on that website again, you'll always get a request from one of your previous clients and you have to go back to your old stack that you're kind of disappointed with now because you've got this new shiny toy that's running in the newest website. But you still have to work with the old kind of muddy toy that, really still makes money old and busted the old and busted one yeah <laughs> um all of this was a thing that I would, that that I thought well a lot of this is actually solved by multi-site but I did have like a bit of experience at that point with uh with infrastructure and I also kind of knew that I didn't want to fall into the headache of having my one very popular client um, slowing down all of my other clients because those other clients are going to ask, why is my website slow? And if I want to make sure that doesn't happen, I just have to buy really expensive hardware. And that was sort of like a rat race I didn't want to fall into. So that sort of leads to multi-tenancy, making sure that you can have the same code base, you can have the same plugin, theme stack, whatever. But having a lot of single side websites actually share that. And they have their own databases. They have their own uploads uh, in, in you know, something like EFS or wherever. And suddenly, you can actually work with this stuff with uh, stuff like containers. And you can make Kubernetes do things with uh, multi-tenancy. And this whole world opens to making a lot of websites manageable with very little people. Because suddenly, you get to sort of work on this, uh, well, SaaS or or was kind of depending on what it does, but you get to you get to actually work with that uh, with maybe one or two people if you really want to up the production and if you really want to make sure that some things happen. But basically, one person can actually know exactly what the effect of some new code will be. All of those ten hundred thousand websites, because you know what the websites look like. That's maybe also a point I have to dig in a bit deeper because that was actually one of the other things I really hated about the way that I worked in in like that agency style that I would have my preferential stack, but there's always these exceptions. Like this this one client asked for a certain thing that that you know maybe they wanted a carousel or something on their on their website. So I had to add a whole new plugin for that. And this other client wanted this, and maybe there's like a weird mail plugin that's happening in this other website. So now suddenly, if I if I would actually be able to update my core stack, I need to test all of these websites because I don't actually know what the code will do to any new code, to any new update. And having everything being uniform, so basically starting thinking about it as a SaaS, as a WAS, that makes it so much easier, so much uh, cognitively uh, 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 less of a load to actually think and reason about this product that you've built because you just you know what the code looks like. The only the only factor that you have to that you have to think about is what could be in the database and how can I handle that? How can make how can I uh, uh, um, how can I catch my exceptions for that in a proper way, et cetera, et cetera. But you'll never have to sort of guess. Could there be maybe a plugin that 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 ruins everything, and I'll get like four sites that go that go down simply because there's this carousel thing that's actually not compatible? You know, and and I think that was maybe like like a like a like a maybe actually like a ten minute explanation in short, in a nutshell about the difference. I think. <laughs> no, I mean it's a good explanation because I think it. 
I've been in your shoes, so I, I completely get it. There's also other edge cases, but I think you covered it pretty well with the idea of like, okay, we have no way of testing things, basically. Because if like, let's say you you have an older site that uses plugin that was using like plugin A, but in an older version, and then something breaks, like with how you integrated that plugin A in the older site versus like the newer site, um, like updating that plugin can still cause issues. Like for example, if you don't, if you if you're not testing all the sites, which is another huge problem in WordPress, is just testing is really painful. It, it really is, yeah, it really is. And after testing, if it doesn't actually work out, actually rolling back to yeah some previous version. Up. Well, I think with your platform, it must be pretty straightforward. I mean, it must be somewhat straightforward to do. Like you can just basically restore either the oh. the older version or just reinstall the older plugin. Yeah, so basically what we do, um, uh, we have a versioning system that you'll make a version of your product, of your SaaS. Um, so that's a certain plugin stack, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can do is you can uh, create a new version based on that old version. Uh, so you can sort of see that as a uh, branch, as a Git branch. Um, you can make changes in that branch. You can um, uh, you can add plugins, update plugins, whatever you will. And what you can then do is you can um, move tenants from the first version to the later version, and that will actually make sure that those tenants then use the newer code base, the, the updated mm-hmm. plugins, etc. If that goes wrong, and you actually kept your older version, um, you can just move your tenant back. And they'll run on the old code base again. So that's the simplest way that we could think of to have this versioning system within a multi-tenant context and have a safe deployment system in there. I mean, all of this can be dealt with with an API. So there's also this, uh, there's also the possibility of having a CI/CD uh, pipeline that does some form of automated testing, which should be possible because you could fairly well know what your plugin stack will actually produce in terms of Mm -hmm. HTML. And you could fairly well know what you can actually test in there. So then you can move that one tenant to the new version, run some end-to-end tests on that uh, tenant. And if they fail, you just move it back. And then you flag that one tenant as we probably should check this out because something's off here. And then you go to the next tenant and you go to the next and you go to the next. Hey everyone, Bob WP dropping into the show for a short break to tell you more about our two pod friends and to thank them for their amazing support. When you build a client site, after the fact, you are doing one or two things. Continuing to help them maintain their site or simply handing it over. Now, whatever the case may be, you need to give your clients even more confidence in running their Woo shop. OS Training has a great collection of WooCommerce tutorials that will help your clients get the most out of their site. And as a bonus for you, the builder, you can also find training to enhance your knowledge as they continue to grow their WordPress and WooCommerce developer training. So whether it's for yourself or to help your clients understand and take control of their WooShop, OS Training has you covered at OSTraining.com. Our sponsor Nexus has made some game-changing enhancements to their managed hosting plans. These include WooCommerce Automated Testing, Sales Performance Monitor, and Plugin Performance Monitor to keep you or your client sites powerful, profitable, and error-free. Trust me, we know it as Do The Woo is powered by Nexus. Now, best of all, All of these are free with any Nexus plan, so make sure and take a moment and head over to nexus.net. Make sure and check out both of these pod friends, and now let's get back to the show. Is there any automated testing involved? Anything with unit testing or even visual regression testing to try and test those sites when you change versions? So not, not from our side, because in that sense, we give you the cloud platform to run multi-tenancy, right? But we can't be sure how your site is actually testable. Right. Uh, I mean, the moment that you have a video there, uh, our visual tester 
might not take that into account. And if we do take that into account, we might not take other stuff into account. So we'll never really be able to have a generic way of testing all of this stuff. But our customers know their own products really, really well. And they should be able to do everything perfectly. Yeah, and they should be able to want to use the tools they want to use as well. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And exactly, right? I agree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think it's good. I mean, well, from my perspective, too, because I'm kind of developer focused, like there's nothing wrong like having a blueprint or something like, oh, you don't know how to start like visual regression testing. Well, you could use this tool and then here's like a small guide of how, like how to do it. But tying the entire platform to like a specific way of doing things probably would anger more developers than necessarily help. <laughs> and, and I mean, we, we're already on the edge there because we we offer multi-tenant WordPress, which is already kind of an opinionated thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's true. But I feel like all hosting is a bit opinionated and it's a bit also the same. Like you were talking earlier, it was like you were talking earlier, like you just have a comfortable way. And the way I usually describe it is just like, Every, all most WordPress hosting now is all vanilla, but it's like, what flavor of vanilla do you like? Do you like do you like <laughs> French vanilla? Do you want just the 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 cheesy fake tasting vanilla that you get with like soft serve ice cream? Like, what type of vanilla flavor do you want? But it's still vanilla. Madagascar vanilla. It's it's a requirement. Yeah. Okay. See, we have fancy Zach here yeah, with course, his Madagascar vanilla. Vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> But I think the the interesting thing about all of this is that you know we're we're decoupling the management of these stacks from what necessarily the infrastructure is, which is is a good thing. Um, now the infrastructure can be managed separately the from the stack of website code, right? And I think that's huge. Being able to bring your own tools and do your own thing. You know, most of the hosts are using opinionated solutions for things like visual regression testing, right? Um, you now there's uh, every host, it seems at this point, has their own tool for, for VRT and for automatic updates of plugins. And um, automatic updates can be dangerous. They can be very risky. And you now... It depends on the site, but in the context of WooCommerce, which we're talking about here, um, automatic updates on a plugin could stop your checkout flow from running completely. And a VRT tool isn't going to catch that. So, you know, chances are visual regression testing is going to see a checkout that looks the same. It's not going to see a checkout that suddenly doesn't run when you hit place order, right? So it's really important to have a, a really defined method for handling these updates and being able to test them across a stack of stores. And um, if you were doing this without multi-tenancy, you'd have to make those changes and test against every single store individually. Whereas with multi-tenancy, you're going to want to test them all. But if you've tested one, chances are the rest are probably going to be okay. And, you know, you, you can do just smoke testing on the rest of them, you know, run a single no, order through no. or whatever, you know, whatever your smoke testing protocol is at that point. But you don't have to do the full regression testing on every site once you know that the stack itself is working because of that consistency. And I think that's a really important point. Um, if you're running multiple WooCommerce sites as an agency, this is probably your ideal situation where you have a stack where you can run the same things. You're running the same payment processors or, or a group of payment processors that you know are consistent and you turn them on or off based on the client's needs, right? You have a number of plugins that are used for, uh, marketing and other features like shipping, uh, tax calculation, these types of things that are going to remain relatively consistent across all of the sites you're working on. Yeah, and in that sense, let's let's also not forget like the 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 new client asks for something new, you implement that feature into your multi-tenant product, and you can then contact your old clients and say like. 
oh, hey, would you maybe also like a carousel on your on your homepage or a bigger feature that's a bit more <laughs> meaningful for that client, obviously. Um, but you actually get to provide more value and you can keep providing value for your customers, even if they've uh, basically long ago only bought that website. But you can still say, okay, so we actually have this new feature. Would you like us to do anything with that? So you can keep go you can keep that that account management going in that way also and then where you can go after that is also okay we've got this nice bigger SaaS was and we can start automatically selling that to people in a sort of a self-service way Mm -hmm. because eventually i think and i think that's also the the beauty of for example multi-site is that you do have the ability to know you basically have the ability to know a lot about a niche. You know something about WordPress and you can make something in WordPress is exactly for that niche. You can make the perfect website, the perfect e-commerce site for a very specific uh, group of people. And that will work so much better than any Shopify or Squarespace ever can simply because you have that knowledge, because you have that, that will to actually make this for those people. If you can actually automatically sell that then and work with that as a SaaS, as a was, then you as a person can learn a lot about WordPress and you can learn a lot about DBA and you can learn a lot about maybe even the underlying infrastructure or third party, third party uh, services. And you can have that value multiplied by the amount of actual customers that you have very, very easily without having to go into like the whole infrastructural layer and also having to learn how an AWS data center works or how an AWS VPC works. Yeah, there's a lot to learn on AWS. You definitely don't want to, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can very much relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, my product's also on top of AWS and I, part of the price is just not having to deal with that. Like part of the value is just not having to deal with that. And that's for a good reason, because because it's hard and you can do it wrong. And you can do it really wrong. Yeah. And if you do it really wrong, then your e-commerce site is going to go down. And that's going to cost you a lot of money, besides the servers that are still up and running and costing you money via AWS. If you can actually get somebody else to do that stuff for you, uh, that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I see it all the time. I mean, I, my consulting is like cloud audits and stuff like that. Like I go through people's like AWS bills and I... Like one one client had like five hundred dollar a month hard drives that they had provisioned but not attached to anything. So they were just <laughs> like they were just like sitting there. They were just sitting there, not used, costing them five hundred dollars a month. It was just like <laughs> like just no, get rid of it. Like get rid of that, please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, like that's like that's half the thing with AWS is that it's really easy sometimes if you're not careful to um, shoot yourself in the foot and leave stuff running and then you end up paying for it and you can't find it because the console's straight out of... I I mean, I started as a Windows sysadmin, so I get a lot of PTSD from my Windows sysadmin days <laughs> from like the AWS console. It's very, it's very large. Everything's all over the place. It's hard to find things. So many context menus. <laughs> so many context menu. They make it incredibly easy to spend money and hard to stop spending it. I think that might be a feature. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I've had a lot of discussions around it. This is a bit of a tangent, but I mean, I feel like they should have some sort of safety valve thing i mean so like the secret so the the larger thing is i think ethically and morally they should have a a thing because i'm just waiting for the one day that somebody is going to do a like some sort of it's going to be it's some a i'm sure it's some ai thing because they're going to just provision some gpu leave it running forget about it and end up with like a twenty thousand dollar (laughs) bill and then they'll freak out and they'll be like my life's ruin and do something really drastic when if you're in AWS, the thing is, if you know AWS and you're in the kind of like ecosystem, you know that if you make a mistake like that, you can contact support. Yeah, but if you don't know that, but if you don't know that, you might think you're on the hook for like twenty, thirty, yeah. fifty thousand dollars. 
There's this one story, right, about uh, about a guy who made a who made the lambda. Uh, uh, yeah, there was a. You see a story every year, a year and a half, like true. It's often true Reddit, but basically, I'm just kind of waiting for like the one day where somebody is going to have that reaction, but n- not talk to anyone and just think their life's over, or like they didn't know, and then it'll be on AWS's side. So like that's kind of like my position on on the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, they make it really, really easy for you to, and uh, it's a hundred percent a feature because for like the larger enterprise customers, you know, I talk with, I talk with, with, when I do some sales calls, I, I, I talk with people who work with companies, they get a $200 million discount oh, wow. from, AW, <laughs> from the AWS discount. <laughs> Not actually like that's how much they pay. That's the discount they get on how much they're spending on it. So it's like for them, it's like a it, it's it sounds like it's a it's a rounding error, even that fifty thousand dollars. But for that person, it's like that that is that is that can be life ending. Yeah, exactly. Sure. So I'm very very displeased with that. It's a feature, but they need to. I get why they do it, but they need something for the more the individual that just spin up an account and then like shoot that like, prevent them from shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess it's, it's, it's also a bit of a question of how much, how much, right. Because you go to AWS to have this whole data center um, at your fingertips and have all of that power. But at the same time, that also usually means like all of that responsibility, right? Like I, because I agree, they, there needs to be a way to go into AWS where your hand is 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 held much better and much more, and you can't make seventy dollar seventy thousand dollar mistakes. But then again, you do still want to leave people open to the complexity and the power of it. Yeah, exactly. Because I have to deal with that too. Because people connect like with email, people connect their AWS account. So I don't want it to be like so restrained that I'm like, okay, you need to sign up, but now you need to make like these 15 support tickets <laughs> right. to get like your quotas <laughs> changed so that you can actually use the product, right? So, so I get it, but it's it's I I like I don't know like what the solution is. It's just like it just feels like it's something waiting to happen. That kind of scenario that that scenario yeah, that totally. I'm talking about. Like everybody that's kind of in that space like knows that it's like it's gonna happen someday and it's gonna be terrible and they're gonna get tons of bad PR out of it. It's just it's the only way something's gonna change is until that happens and it's like tragic that that's kind of everybody sees it. Um and nothing gets done, basically. Well, and it may be helpful for them to, you know, stop having an administrative dashboard full of anti patterns. Um, <laughs> that might yeah. help. A little. I mean, I Fair feel enough. like it was. I feel they just hired the old designers from Windows Server, and then they were just like, <laughs> "Make us a UI, or make us an, a console," and then they're like, "But it's it's you know, I I I don't know for you, uh, but." I, like I deal with the APIs a lot and the APIs are all different. Like they're like, they all, be, they're all different. Like I'm basically like half my product is just standardizing some of the APIs so that I can use them like in a more cohesive way. But like I'm doing tagging right now and like every service tags differently. It's, it's maddening. It's like they all have tags, but it's all handled differently. And I'm just like, this is maddening. Yeah. There's, there is no standard across their APIs by any means. No, exactly. So, but they're stable. So I'll give them that. Like I, I would still get in, I would still get, would rather be in business with AWS than anybody else because the the APIs are stable, but it's it's maddening that something like tags is so different, basically. You'd think like, oh, this will be the easiest thing to do. And it's like, oh no, this is like actually maddeningly annoying that it's like so different. Like some of them you can update them directly from the resources, some of them you have to tag them, some of them use associative arrays, some of them it's like key value, like you have to do key X, value that, and it's like, oh my Be god. Be careful what you ask for though, because you may end up with ATS, the Amazon tagging service in the near future. Oh, you'll probably end up with that service and and they'll call it something like Amazon Dart. <laughs> yeah, all all, the, all it does is tag things. Yeah, like some automating take Tag thing would be great. But yeah, I mean, that seems to be the thing, right? When they 
when they need to standardize something like they they decided hey we need to standardize access what did we get for that well we got a standardized access layer you know, we we got i am right they they needed to standardize other things like how to run you know small snippets of code so we got lambda we <laughs> a lot of the the things that are aws now have come out of the needs of customers and become their own services i still remember when it was just ec2 and s3 and that was pretty much it and now there's like 700 <laughs> services so many services yeah, and i guess i guess i guess that's also a part of of not having to put it in one big package i guess that's that's sort of the that's sort of the 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 the, the, the blessing but also the curse that aws has that they have all of these different services that you could actually use in isolation and they never actually have to think about how to get all of those services to work together. So you get APIs that work in a completely different way because obviously those teams are going to make different decisions than these teams. I mean, imagine if you have to talk to maybe 5,000 different engineers if you want to debate how to actually tag something. Um, so you'll get like this sort of difference that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I can imagine that's actually really, really hard to. to but sometimes they just come out with weird products. Like the joke, especially for you, for you, since you use containers a lot, is like how many container services AWS has. Like it's like, yeah, there's so many, there's so <laughs> many, there's so many con- container services. They could just have one, but instead they have like 13. Instead they have like 13 of them. So it's yeah. like, it's, it's they a- all serve different purposes, right? Supposedly. Um, Supposedly. <laughs> but yeah, and I think this this whole space is really interesting, the infrastructure side. Uh, but it's really cool that, you know, with WPCS, you've been able to kind of standardize the multi tenancy piece a bit. Uh, Carl, with Emir, you've been able to do mad scientist y things, create some stability to running auto scaling. WordPress on top of uh, AWS. Yeah, I mean that's that's the main thing is the scaling. Also, it's just I just didn't. I'm kind of like Vaynan. Uh, Vaynan, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, love it. Second try, got it. Um, <laughs> I just don't want to. Like, I've been assistant min since I'm like 16. I just I don't I don't want to do it. Like. I don't like I I don't want to be on call anymore. Yeah, you're building tools that do the work for you basically. And well, I'm building tools that try to just keep the site up regardless of what you blast at it, which was what I was like testing yesterday basically. I was just like, okay, what happens if 1500 people are just like checking out and buying things like right away and it's like what's gonna break and it's like what's gonna break how is it gonna behave and it was just like oh this is okay this holds so i'm like this is great so <laughs> perfect <laughs> yeah no but be, because it's it's the same thing right you you don't want to have like what we were talking about because that's a bit what wcs is is solving as well is like you don't want to have to constantly be like, okay, I have to think about upscaling. I have to downscale. If I don't downscale, I, I, if I don't downscale, like I do sales calls around that. Like it's just, it's even if you don't have to worry about the infrastructure, you have to worry about like scaling it up and remembering to scale it down. And then if somebody doesn't warn you and the whole thing is just, it's still stress. Um, It's still responsibility that you would just rather not have. And it's, uh, in, you know, and what I talk a lot with people from the JavaScript ecosystem and they're like, like they get it, they get it right away. Cause they're like the deploy the Vercel and they're like, doesn't matter if I get 1500 people, like it's, yeah, it works. Totally. It works. We don't want to have to think about this. Like, uh, and it's, and I think it's also that exact reason is why something like WPCS can, can, can exist and can actually serve people, but that's exactly the same reason why something like a WAS can exist and actually serve people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm th- I'm going to talk about that too at WordCamp Asia, but yeah, you're right. Because like before, if you wanted to do a WAS, you'd need an entire ops team. Right, exactly. And now, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and now like you can, you can just get WPCS 
or or me and then basically oh like i don't actually like need a cloud engineer or like a, an army of cloud engineers to like run my business i can focus on like the code optimizing the code that doesn't mean that like you can just be like stupid and just be like i want to do f- you know 100 inserts per order and then it's not going to blow up but that's a code problem that's exactly you you get to focus on that layer right yeah. yeah exactly you can focus on the code and how it affects the infrastructure but not so much on like running and maintaining that infrastructure and in and in return for that like our customers customers get to focus on their presumably business because they get to just enjoy a WordPress website that just sort of works for their specific use case because 100%. the builder just knew that use case, that niche really well. So you, you get sort of, sort of delegation of, of, of responsibilities that... Yeah, or specialization. That's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah. It's more like specializations. Or specialization, yeah. This is how I feel like, and we're kind of in the same boat, you and me, but like we're basically... We're kind of the people talking in the early 2000s about the cloud. They're like, the cloud, like, have you not heard about the cloud? And it's like, no, you're crazy. Like, you run your own data centers and you have an army of, like, sysadmins to run them. It's like, or Or you could not have an army of sysadmins (laughs) pay AWS a premium and let their experts, which they'll have way better experts than you'll ever have, like, deal with that and then you kind of focus it's kind of the same thing like you're you're not aws but like you're making all these like multi-tenant pieces work together really well and you focus on that and they don't have to focus on making wordpress perform like super super well they just have to make sure that their plot their like either their site or their their wordpress product like your your the was like scales and and does things properly like uh, like we were talking about like database inserts but that's what they can specialize in that's what they have the expertise in like they're plugin developers they're wordpress developers they're not they're not sysadmins i'm not a dba like so and i'm a pretty big i'm a pretty good developer and i still don't call myself a dba so you can let the people but you could like you let those people do what they're good at and then you just kind of hire that specialization. And then you, as as the consumer of that service, can apply that in scale. Because I think that's that's the biggest thing there. Um, whenever you apply something in scale, that will take not necessarily all of your time, but close to all of your time. And the people that are, that are actually experts at making sure that there's hard drive failover and that all of these servers keep running and that the actual metal will still work and not catch fire you know i've never really been in a data center physically but i think i get to get the gist there (laughs) yeah like if you're not stuck like if you were on like ovh like ovh when their data center caught fire like last year and then you're like oh i'm on ovh and it's like do you have backups like no no (laughs) but that's it but those are things you're responsible for when when you're the one that has to manage all that, you have to be like I have backup, but yeah, and, and and that works on and that works on scale on all of those levels, right? Like we as WPCS need to make sure that there's backups of um uh, of a plethora of different things that are much more uh, much bigger than one client, basically. But our clients, our customers, have to make sure that they have backups of very specific things of their customers, of their, um, uh, the websites, their tenants in that sense. And that is also like a completely different way of looking at those two, those two things, right? We can't actually restore a backup that restores every database in our, um, in our cloud system because, well, I mean, this person may need a restore, but the person on the other side of the system definitely did not. And we can restore both of those things. But we can actually get our customers to do to think about that in the context of their product um, much easier. Because they don't have to worry about the whole storage bit. They don't have to worry about how to actually make, how to actually do a database dump. They just have to think, when is a backup actually necessary for this one product that I'm building, you know? Especially if they're not aware that there's sharding and all that stuff going on behind the scenes as well. Exactly. 
you get to you get to focus on the actual WordPress part of it, and you get to specialize in PHP, you get to specialize in WordPress and WooCommerce, and you get to specialize in selling that product that you build. And you don't and you don't accidentally have to go knee deep into EC two. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, and I think you know if if you manage WooCommerce stores, that you should be looking at some of these things. Um, that the possibility of multi tenancy at Things like auto scaling and you know have, having to not worry about your infrastructure as much, because all of those things are going to take you as as an agency owner that works on on WooCommerce sites or as an individual contributor who works on WooCommerce sites, and let you focus on the needs of store owners rather than just on how can I make PHP do what I want it to do today, um, and how can I make these servers stop catching fire um every time that you know there's a traffic event so i think this has been a very valuable conversation um we're at the hour here so i want to make we're actually a little beyond the hour so i want to make sure we uh we have a chance to wrap up here and give people a a chance to uh you know follow you uh, Wayne Ant and, and uh, um, the best place to find us is uh, on our website wpcs.io. Um, but we are also on LinkedIn. We're also on Facebook. Um, if you find, if you look for WPCS, you'll find it. And wpcs.io is where you can actually sign up, and you can get started right away. So, uh, thank you, Feynant, for joining us today. It's been a great uh, conversation. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> that was an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for having. Me. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show and Bob WP here again. I'd like to give one more shout out to our two pod friends. Whether it's for yourself or a team member or a client when looking for WordPress or WooCommerce training, do check out OSTraining.com. And Nexus Managed Hosting, where you will get WooCommerce automated testing and sales performance monitor to keep your client shops running smoothly. Also, if you have any topics that you think we should dig deep into during an upcoming dev chat, please let us know. So until the next time, keep on doing the woo.